Kinematics, you know, is the study of motion. And very simplistically, motion can be uniform, where it means that an object has constant velocity, or the velocity does not change. But that's, of course, very simplistic, and a lot of motion is not uniform. So the velocity changes. That, of course, leads to the concept of acceleration. And I just want to mention a few points about acceleration. Acceleration is a vector. I've drawn it with a little arrow over top. And it literally refers to how fast the velocity changes. So the formula is the change in velocity over the change in time. If the velocity changes by a lot over a short period of time, then you have a higher acceleration. So the units for velocity are in meters per second, and the units for time are in seconds, which gives acceleration of unit of meters per second per second is actually a nice way to think about it. How many meters per second does the velocity change in one second? But it is a little easier to write, of course, as meters per second squared. We could alternately write the formula instead of writing change in v, we could denote the change in velocity as the final velocity of an object minus the initial velocity of an object divided by the change in time over which that velocity changed. And of course the final and the uh, initial don't necessarily have to be the start and the stop of the motion. They could be any times during the motion that we're interested in looking at. So there's two formulas for acceleration. Um, they should basically mean the same thing to you. But to really study motion in more depth, we want to be able to compare more things together than just velocity and acceleration and time. So to do this, we're going to need to develop more formulas that we can use. And in the rest of this video, I'm going to give you the basics of how we develop those formulas. I'm going to show you uh, with two simple formulas the basic way that we derive them, and then end with kind of a look at all the formulas that we use for kinematics. So deriving an equation is the term we use for developing an equation from other equations that we already know. So I'm going to start down with writing two equations that we either know or are pretty much common sense to us. So we know that the average velocity is equal to the change in distance over the change in time. But if we think about average and what average means to all of us normally, it's kind of like the middle, right? It's halfway in between. So if an object did indeed change velocity, then we could say the average is halfway in between its initial velocity and its final velocity. So we could also represent average velocity as this way, initial velocity plus final velocity divided by 2. And let's quickly note that this does assume that the velocity is always changing at the same rate, or in other words, the acceleration is uniform or constant. It doesn't speed up more at the beginning and less at the end. Given two equations like this, we can use them to derive other equations that will be useful for us to solving problems. So here's two sets of quantities that are both equal to the same thing. right? Average velocity is equal to this thing, and average velocity is equal to that thing. Well, if they're both equal to average velocity, then we can also say that these two things that I've circled are equal to each other. So the change in distance over change in time is equal to the initial plus final velocity divided by 2 because these are both different ways of writing average velocity. Well, if I now multiply both sides by t, then the resulting formula that I would get is uh, displacement is equal to initial velocity plus final velocity divided by 2 times the time. And that might not seem like anything new or novel, but we do now have a formula that we just developed that has four different variables in it. We've got a displacement, we've got an initial velocity, a final velocity, and a change in time, all in one formula. There may be situations that a formula like this is more useful to us and can help us solve a problem. So we would basically are going to add it to our collection of formulas. I'm going to show one more example of how a formula is derived. Let's again start with two equations that we know. So I'm going to first start with the one that I just derived, and then also another formula for acceleration that I wrote closer to the top of the page. The one on the right here, I'm going to do a little bit of rearranging. I'm going to multiply both sides by delta t, so times delta t, so I get 
acceleration times delta time is equal to velocity final minus velocity initial. Then I'm also going to add velocity initial to both sides so I get velocity final isolated by itself. So then velocity final is equal to acceleration times time minus, sorry, plus velocity initial. So what I'm arguing is that velocity final is equal to this set of terms, this acceleration times time plus velocity initial. Well, if that's true, then I can take that piece of information, what velocity final is equal to, and plug it right in my other formula in place of velocity final in there. And then I can rewrite that equation. So then I get displacement is equal to velocity initial plus and now instead of velocity final, I add this other thing. So acceleration times time plus velocity initial. And all of that has to be divided by 2 and multiplied by the change in time. And this might be looking complicated, but I'm just applying simple math operations, basically. And what I just did is called a substitution. I substituted one piece of information for another. Now let's rearrange this one so it looks a little more usable and user-friendly. So first of all, I've got two initial velocities in this equation. So I'm going to consolidate them, bring them together. So now my displacement is equal to 2vi plus acceleration times time divided by 2 times delta t. You may have noticed I've dropped my delta from this t in the middle of my equation. It doesn't really matter. Uh, I'll explain later that often the deltas are left out of the final equations anyway. The next thing I'm going to do is use the distribution property to bring that delta t to the inside of our brackets there to get rid of our brackets. So my displacement will be equal to, now I have 2 velocity initial times time plus acceleration, uh, let me put a delta t there, times delta t squared and that all still has to be divided by 2. One last step, I've got a 2 in one of my terms on the top and on the bottom, so I'm going to cross it out of one term and just leave it with the other term, so that my displacement equation will look like velocity initial times the change in time, plus 1 half acceleration times the change in time squared. And I'm going to leave my equation looking like this for now. Again, uh, it doesn't really matter what format the equation is in, exactly which step I would have left it at, but this is typically something like what the kinematics equations look like. Again, it's an equation that has displacement, initial velocity, time, and acceleration in it. And I'm just going to leave the deriving process there for now. So a whole lot more equations could be derived, and we could potentially make up tons of new equations, but there's a few kinematics equations that together are very useful in our physics toolbox, you might say, and that we're going to want to use to solve equations. These are two of them, and there's a bunch more. And I would encourage you, if you're interested, to look up the derivations of the rest in a textbook or online. But for right now, I'm just going to write the other ones down for you. So here are those two equations with two others collected together to form our toolbox. I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, I did leave off the delta signs. We should keep in mind that when I say d with an arrow, it does mean displacement, does mean a change in position, and the time means a change in time. But it does get a little tedious to write, and it, it kind of is obvious in the context of most e uh, problems. I also want to mention I left the vector notation on all of them except for the last one because the derivation of that one uh, involved removing those vectors. So technically that's a scalar form. So you might be wondering what good all of these equations are going to do us. But let's look carefully at which variables are in which equations. So our first equation lists displacement, initial velocity, final velocity, and time as the four variables involved there. Our second equation also has displacement, has also initial velocity, has no final velocity. Instead, it has time and acceleration. Our third one has displacement, has final velocity, has time, and it also has acceleration. And the last one has 
Again, distance, it has both initial and final velocities or speeds technically, and acceleration, but this time it has no time. So of our five available quantities of displacement, initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, and time, so there's five of these available to us. Each equation has four of the five, and each one has a different four of the five. And if we would add at the top of our list our acceleration formula, we'd have yet another combination of four of the five. So typically, the way kinematics problems go, you will be given three pieces of information, and this is just in general. So three variables you'll know. You will be asked to find one, and then one other piece will often be irrelevant. So of the three that you're given and the one that you're asked for, you will choose an equation that has those four variables so that you can plug in the three you know and solve for the one you don't know. So we'll use them all in different situations and they should help us to solve all kinds of different scenarios and questions about the motion of objects.